Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to lesson number nine, titled The Source of Life. It's ready for teaching on November 30 and is part of the series on the Gospel of John, written by Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. Your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that not only did you create the earth, not only did you create the universe, but that when you created us and knew that there would be a problem, that you provided a way of escape, a way of salvation through Jesus. And this week, as we study the source of life in the book of John, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us through your word. May we understand more about your great love for us, what the gospel means, and how great you are because of what you arranged and did for us. And today I'd like to pray for Virginia Mendoza and her family and her local church in Philadelphia. And also I'd like to continue praying for Dr. Kevin Mace, who's been badly injured, and Joan Skinner and her niece. Joan has asked for prayer. And the great country of Kenya. I've had a number of requests from people from Kenya requesting that we pray for their church and also for their president and for their country. And also there are other countries, Lord, that need your prayers in just so many ways, particularly where your church is struggling because of laws in particular countries. Lord, I pray you'll be with the people who are worshipping you and following you. And Emma's children, Amanda, Karos, and Claudia. Lord, wherever we are, all of our families need your care and hope. And we pray that you will bless us as we open your word this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And to read our memory text again is Rochelle Brady, a member of my church, a leader, a teacher, and mother of two delightful children. Thank you, Rochelle. Our memory text this week is John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the Gospel of John, when asked who he was, Jesus answered, with the term that designates deity. I am was an unmistakable reference to the Lord himself, who had appeared to Moses in the burning bush. As we read in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am, he said to Moses. And the same God, the I am, then, as it says in John 1.14, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The theme I am threads throughout John. This week's memory verse reflects that theme. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14 verse 6. The I am is the light of the world, the bread of life, the gate or door of the sheep, the good shepherd and the true vine. This week continues with the revelation of God has given us in John. We will also more fully explore the flip side of things in which, despite the powerful evidence for Jesus as the Messiah, some rejected him. We will study this idea for two reasons to avoid the same mistake, but also to consider how we might be able to reach out to those in danger of making that mistake as well. Sunday, November 24. In Him Was Life. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Apostle clearly states that Jesus is God, the Divine Son. It reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Consequently, in verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men, the reference to life here has to be divine life, underived eternal self-existence. Because he has life within himself, he can lay down his life and take it again, we read in John 10:17. And because he has life within, he can give life to whom he will, as in John 5:21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And we compare that with John 14, verse 19. Before long, the world will not see me any more, but you will see me, because I live, and you also will live. This term life, or zoe, z-o-e, appears 36 times in the Gospel of John, about 25% of the uses in the New Testament. In John 1, 4 and 5, Besides referring to the source of life on our planet, the word is also linked to salvation. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Throughout the rest of John, this idea of life, Zoe, is most often expressed as everlasting life, the promise of salvation. As you read in John 3, verse 15, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And John 4, verse 14, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And John 4, verse 36, Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. And John 6.27 Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And John 6 verse 40 for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And verse 47, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And John 10 verses 27 and 28. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Thus, the one who gave life at creation is the same one who brings salvation, eternal life, to a lost world. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Well, we'll look at several verses here. John chapter 1 and verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And John 6, verse 40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And John 12 verse 27. 
Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this reason I came to this hour. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we read in John 3:14 and 15, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Just as the bronze serpent took the place of the Israelites who had been bitten by serpents, so Jesus took our place, we who have been struck down by sin. He took the penalty that was ours, so that we might have the life that was his. Christ also desires that we have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10, we read just recently. Thus, for as it says in John 1.12 and 13, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Christ came to reveal the Father to us. For, as it says in John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. By seeing the character of Jesus, we can see the character of the Father. And so to finish today, what can we learn from the life of Jesus about the character of the Father? Why is this revelation such good news? Monday, November 25 The Words of Eternal Life Read John chapter 6, verses 61 to 68. When Jesus asked the disciples if they would leave him, what was the meaning of Peter's answer? John chapter 6, beginning at verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter's words about eternal life tap into a theme that runs throughout the Gospel of John. A concentration of phraseology about eternal life appears in John chapter 6 in the context of the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 27 reads, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And verse 47. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. And verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus says that he is the bread of life in verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty meaning that his life, his death, and his resurrection are the source of eternal salvation. The phrase everlasting life, or its equivalent, occurs at least 17 times in the Gospel of John. 
This term does not refer to a spirit existence or to becoming part of an eternal being or to some other ethereal concept. Rather, it refers to that life-giving power that brings salvation and meaning to our existence now and to life without end when our Lord returns. Just as Jesus became flesh, so the resurrection that Jesus talks about takes place in time and space and in a physical body. It is a resurrection from the dead, a renewal of the life that we once had in Eden. How do we receive eternal life? Well, we read John 3 verses 15 and 16 that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And John 5 verse 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life and verse 40 in chapter 6 for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and i will raise them up at the last day and verse 47 very truly i tell you the one who believes has eternal life and john 8:31 to the jews who have believed him jesus said if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples. And John 12, verse 46, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And John 20, verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. By faith alone we believe that Jesus Christ came to live and to die on our behalf. This faith comes to us as a gift, but we must consciously choose to surrender ourselves to Jesus, to repent and to claim his blood for the forgiveness and cleansing of sin. When Jesus asked Peter if he too was going to leave, Peter's answer, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, in John 6.68, encapsulates the essence of salvation and how we attain it. It doesn't come from philosophy, history or science, all human disciplines. It comes from Jesus, who, possessing in himself eternal life, offers it freely to all who, responding to the Holy Spirit, will accept it. And so to finish today, how does the promise of having eternal life impact how we view our temporal life here? How should it impact how we view it? Tuesday, November 26, Believing and New Birth Read John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. What are the steps described here about becoming a Christian? John 1, beginning at verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decisions or a husband's will, but born of God. John wrote his gospel so that we would believe in Jesus, and that by believing, we may have eternal life in his name, as we read in chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In John 1, verse 12 and 13, this process is described in two steps. First, we receive him, that is, believe in him. Second, he gives us authority or power to become God's children, described in verse 13 as being begotten by God. Thus, there is a human and divine aspect of becoming a Christian. We must act in belief, receive him, and be open to the light. But he is the one who regenerates the heart. In fact, 
Faith itself is a gift of God that comes by hearing His Word, as we read in Romans 10.17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. In order to have true, abiding faith in Christ, we read in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 433, we must know Him as He is represented in the Word. End of quote. And from the same author, from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 940, the Spirit operating upon and enlightening the human mind creates faith in God. End of quote. Those who believe or accept the Son as the Messiah receive everlasting life. John also emphasizes accepting or believing the word that Jesus spoke. And we read that in John 5:24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And verse 38. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. And verse 47, But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? It is the role of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. We read in John 16, verses 7 and 8, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And we compare that with Romans 8 verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Reread Romans 8.16. What principle about salvation in Jesus is found here? We'll read that again, Romans 8.16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Faith, biblical faith, based on the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, is the foundation of our faith. Ellen White writes in, in Heavenly Places, page 104, Faith is the great blessing, the eye that sees, the ear that hears. End of quote. The humanistic approach to faith states that we must find a foundation, the criteria for faith, and then believe. In contrast, the biblical approach states that faith is the foundation, a gift from God. God. As you read in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 17 to 24. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of the sage? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We start with the foundation of faith, and then from there we grow in understanding and grace. And so to finish today, if someone were to ask you what your faith is based on, how would you respond? Wednesday, November 27, Rejecting the Source of Life Some of the saddest accounts in all of Scripture occur in the Gospel of John. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The light was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's John 1, verses 5, 10, and and 11. The I am was rejected by many of his own people. No wonder Paul later warns in Hebrews 10.35, do not cast away your confidence. As we have seen again and again, Christ was rejected because people did not accept his word. Edward Zinke and Roland Hegstad uh, write in the book The Certainty of the Second Coming, published by the Review and Herald Publishing Association, page 96, the contemporary humanistic way of thinking begins with doubt. People question everything in order to determine what is truth. That which survives the fire of cross-examination they accept as rock-solid knowledge, something on which to place one's faith. Some apply the same method to the Bible, calling everything into question from a scientific, historical, psychological, philosophical, archaeological or geological perspective in order to determine what is truth in the Bible. The very method itself starts with and builds upon doubt in the veracity of the Scripture. Christ asked, When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? In Luke 18, verse 8. End of quote. Read Numbers, chapter 13, verses 23 to 33. What made the difference between the two reports the spies brought back about Canaan? So we turn to Numbers chapter 13 and we'll begin with verse 23. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of forty days they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people, they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. 
The sin of the Hebrews, when they were at Kadesh Barnea, was to doubt the word of God. God had asked them to go up and take the land. Twelve spies were sent to Canaan to spy out the land. They came back with two reports. The majority gave a negative report. There are giants in the land, walled cities, weapons we have never seen before, and well-trained armies. By contrast, we have been slaves in the land of Egypt with little military experience. Ten spies voted no, based upon the overwhelming evidence from a human standpoint. Two spies voted yes, based upon their faith in the overwhelming power of the Word of God. And so to finish the day, how do we avoid making the same kind of mistake made here? And yet, how do we also avoid presumption, doing something foolish, but believing that we are doing God's will and therefore cannot fail? Thursday, November 28. Condemnation. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. That's John 3 verses 18 to 21. Let's read the whole passage there now. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And we compare that with John 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Why do people come into judgment? Well, there are several texts here we're going to look at. The first is John chapter 3 and verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And verse 36 of John chapter 3, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And John five twenty four. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And John five thirty eight. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. And John eight twenty four. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. And John twelve forty seven. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The rejection of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, leaves us open to doubt and to the temptations of the devil. It is to turn from light to darkness. Eve was given light on how to relate to the tree in the centre of the garden. Satan tempted her to bring the light into question. She tested God's word by reasoning that a God of love would not destroy the creatures whom he created. She also relied upon the data of her senses. The serpent has eaten of the fruit and now has the power to speak. Perhaps the serpent is right. If I partake of the fruit, I may become like God. Deceived, she turned away from the light, and her husband chose the same path. Read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. What principles did Christ use in the wilderness of temptation to combat the deceptions of Satan? Matthew 4, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. 
The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Christ had at his disposal the same humanistic tool of thought used by Adam and Eve, the antediluvians, and Israel at Kadesh Barnea. He could have asked why a God of love would leave his son in the wilderness for forty days and nights without food and protection. He also could have determined to prove his sonship by turning stones into bread. Instead, he answered with the word of God. He opened on the level of heavenly things rather than on earthly patterns of thought. How easily he could have rationalised his way to a wrong decision, which so many people, even people of faith, often do. Friday, November 29. Further thought. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 25, we read, In stooping to take upon himself humanity... Christ revealed a character the opposite of the character of Satan. But he stepped still lower in the path of humiliation. Being found in fashion as a man, we read in Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of the common priest, So Christ took the form of a servant and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That's quoting from Isaiah 53 verse 5. The comment still continues, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Jesus gave so much to save the world. What do you consider the best ways to help others see this amazing truth and come to him in faith? 2. What are the key differences in making decisions on a human worldly level versus making decisions on the basis of divine revelation? 3. How do such things as logic and reason fit with understanding the word of God? What logical and rational reasons do we have for coming to faith? How do such things as the fulfilment of prophecy, or the astonishing beauty and complexity of the created world, point us logically and rationally to the existence of God and to the truth of the plan of salvation. And four, in class, talk about your answer to the question at the end of Tuesday's study. What is your faith based on? If someone were to ask you why you believe in Jesus and the claims of the gospel, How would you respond? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Please stay by Andrew McChesney. At 8pm, an elderly married couple knocked on the door of the parsonage beside the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Zavunga, Alaska. It wasn't late. The summer sun shone brightly in the sky. It wouldn't go down until 2.30am. The Siberian Yupki people living on St Lawrence Island, located just 36 miles east of Russia, in the Bering Sea, wouldn't go to bed for hours. Eugene and Mari, who were in their mid-80s, didn't wait for anyone to open the door. Nobody waits for the door to be opened in the remote village of 835 people. Everyone knocks and walks in. The couple wanted to speak with the visitor staying in the parsonage. I was visiting the island to collect stories for Adventist mission. 
Mari spoke directly. Are you a pastor? She asked me. Her eyes filled with emotion when I shook my head. Please stay, she said softly. We need someone to keep the church open and to teach us. The church had closed several times since it and the parsonage were built in 1972. Pastors had preached and lived there for a while, but then the Adventist presence shrunk to little to nothing for two decades. In 2010, the church had reopened when two retired nurses from North Carolina, Bill and Eloise Hawks, arrived at Bi- as Bible workers with the Alaska Conference Arctic Mission Adventure Outreach Program to Alaska Natives. Bill died in 2016 and Eloise stayed, but shortly before my visit, Eloise left for health reasons. Mari missed Eloise terribly and described how she invited villagers to her home for meals and prepared food packages. We need her, she said. I never met Eloise. She was enthusiastic and helpful as we exchanged emails for my trip. My respect grew as I heard about her love for the villagers. As our conversation wrapped up at 9pm, Mari looked at me again. Please, she said, stay. We need someone to teach us about God. With her pleading gaze, I caught a sense of the compassion that Jesus must have felt during his earthly ministry. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd, as read in Matthew 9, verse 36 in the New King James Version. I didn't want to leave. My heart ached for the precious people of Savanuga and the other more than 200 native communities in Alaska. Only 11 of those communities have an Adventist presence. When Jesus' heart ached, he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest, as read in Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38 in the New King James Version. Pray for Zavanuga, pray for Alaska, Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering this quarter that will help open a centre of influence to share God's love with Alaska natives in Bethel, Alaska. Remember, God is always faithful.